you know, the greatest woodsmen and woodswomen that I know are pointing out just as many plants and birds as they are like, oh, there's a deer trail. There's deer sign. Look at that rub. We're close to this. This is where they bed. Oh, this is, you know, this bird species. They nest in these lowland certain kind of conifers. So deer like to bed in those too. So this is a great spot to be. Um, And so I think that's the amazing thing people don't realize is that they find their niche, right? And they get hooked on it. Like Mm -hmm. I am a hunter, uh, non-consumptive, whatever, don't want to talk about it. But if I talk to you about pheasant habitat, the parallel to that is pollinator habitat. This is the Aptitude Outdoors podcast, where we interview travelers, explorers, and outdoorsmen and women to bring you the best tips and stories from around the world. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Aptitude Outdoors podcast. Thanks for tuning back in today. We have Michaela Labute out in the UP. Michaela, how are you doing? Hi, I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. That is great. Uh, so from what I can tell, you're a lifelong youper, which holds a special place in the heart of all Michiganders. It separates you from the rest of the crowd. Uh, I grew up in Southeast Michigan and like the UP, I feel like should have its own standing as its own country because it's just a, such a wild place. So what what do you love about the Upper Peninsula that we already all don't know enough about? It's It's a beautiful place, hidden gem. I'd say after living downstate for a handful of years and only recently moving back, the thing I love the most about the Upper Peninsula is that there's parts of it that are still wild, that no matter how much research you do or how many YouTube videos you watch, you can't find it unless you're a local. And that is what I love the most. And it's, you know, right up there on, you got two great lakes pretty much on either side. Well, probably almost access to three, two, three. Yeah, Huron just touches Michigan there. We'll yeah, take it, it. Yeah, it's beautiful. So uh, Great Lakes, I'm a huge proponent of the Great Lakes. So lots of issues going on with the Great Lakes. What's your favorite of the Great Lakes? I know you get, it's a hard choice, but usually it's the one where you live by, but. Yeah, um, I'm going to join the majority here and say Lake Superior because um, Isle Royale is within it and Isle Royale holds a special special place within my heart. Um I live on Lake Michigan, but there's something about Lake Superior and its untamedness that and I think it steals the hearts of everyone. Yeah, and Isle Royal is somewhere I really want to get within hopefully the next couple of years. I just have so many things planned. It's hard to get anywhere at any point in time, but that's like a bucket list. That place is so awesome. I've heard nothing but good things. You've obviously spent some time there. What's What's so awesome about it? I feel like I'm giving away a secret that people sh- that don't live in the Midwest and Michigan should know, but. Oh well. Yeah. Isle Royal is a gem. Um, they'll tell you when you get on the Ranger three out of Houghton and you do the national park service spiel on your way there, that it is the least visited national park, but it is the most revisited national park um, of all of them, which is a testament to what it makes people feel when they go there. For me, oh, it's a tough question because it's tough to give me a label because am I a birder? Am I a botanist? Am I an outdoors woman? Am I a naturalist? You name it. Um, But I would say with Isle Royale, I think it's an amazing blend of uh, cultural and natural history and ecological wonderment that you don't really find anymore. Um, And the people that you meet there have that same Uh, love for the outdoors and that sense of adventure that you have. So aside from being remote and really feeling wild, it it captures, it somehow has managed to preserve um, incredible history of human civilization all the way down to Michigan's more recent history, and then captures some very rare flora and fauna and ecosystems that are very hard to find in today's world. Yeah, I think no matter what activity any people that I've talked to or you know or talk to we get into, I think what we're all looking for is a place where there's not a lot of distractions and stuff that we deal with every everyday life. Like on the way to the studio here, I mean, there's I'm almost getting hit by cars, people on their cell phones not paying attention and work or, or on computers all day. And when you go up to some place like that, it just it, none of that matters. Anytime I'm outdoors, none of it matters. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's funny too, even on Isle Royale, there's one spot on the Rock Harbor end where you can maybe, if you've got the fanciest of fancy phones or computers, believe it or not, some people do bring them when they don't realize that their significant other isn't taking them on a beach getaway. Um, And so they'll be on their computer and they'll get a bar, they'll jump for joy and they'll be talking into their phone. Um, But Eventually, you'll even hear people discussing like, oh, darn, I wish I didn't have a signal right here Um, just because they would love being out on the trail and away from even that thought that they could connect. Yeah. And you have a a background in conservation biology and you have the a long resume done work with DNR, you know, wildlife division and recreation division. Yep. Uh, United States Forest Service Wildlife. You've worked with MUCC, who just had Nick Green on. You, you've run the gamut. So what drew you to working in conservation? Because like for someone like me, it's near and dear to my heart. I'm all about conservation. I'm trying to raise awareness about like some of the issues and, you know, successes going on in the conservation world. But what what specifically made you say, I want this to be my career, my lifetime, you know? Yes. So... Uh, As you can imagine, as a youper, I have the same story as most of us. I grew up with a family that hunted and fished and took us outside every chance we had. But I think the big thing that nudged me into the field of conservation as a career was a summer internship in high school. The Forest Service out of Rapid River actually came to Big Baby Knock High School, where I was um, near graduating in 11th grade. And they're like, this is a great opportunity if you're interested you know, we'll do interviews. That was my first job interview at uh, 16, uh, almost 17. And I'm talking to these federal officials about why I want to work outdoors in the Hiawatha National Forest. Um, I had no idea that it could be a career, uh, you know, that I could. And so it was a great opportunity with the Youth Conservation Corps that the federal government offered uh, with the Forest Service uh, on Hiawatha and national forest lands across the country. In some areas, it's still running. I don't believe it's still running in the Upper Peninsula anymore. Um, But yeah, I got to go outside from June through August in high school and head to Rapid River and jump in the uh, van with some other young, inspiring conservationists or just clueless teenagers, whatever (laughs) we were. And We did everything from timber sale, tree marking with the timber crew. We did biological uh, surveys with the uh, biologists. So looking at bluebird nesting success, um, rare raptor species. We looked at monarchs, all kinds of species that were of concern on the Hiawatha. We did uh, maintenance. We cleared trails. We improved campgrounds on the national forest. So I had this opportunity to just totally immerse myself for two months mind wide open and all the different components of conservation that you could cover. Um, It was really interesting, but I will admit that even after that, I started college and I was going to be like, I'm going to be a political scientist and I'm going to be a diplomat to France. (laughs) (laughs) Interesting choice. Yeah. (laughs) Yep. Yep. So, um, and then, but I just kept getting nudged in that direction. And then I am grateful to live nearby a state park. Uh, born and raised near a state park and great opportunity to join the state government and kind of learn another component. Um, I was kind of initially leaning towards recreation, um, but then I kind of got bit by the science bug and I I really fell in love with the flora and fauna and ecology as a whole. And I really started to pursue that. Hey, everybody. Thanks for checking out this episode. If you feel like you're getting something out of it, go down in the link below and buy me a coffee. The Aptitude Outdoors podcast is fully self-funded by me. So if you're digging it, you know, I'm just throwing out a tip jar and I appreciate you listening. Let's dive right back into this episode. So what separates, you know, the Upper Peninsula's ecology and, you know, plant life and stuff from, say the southern part of Michigan because it, every time I've been to the Upper Peninsula, I feel like I'm going to a different place. Like, I don't feel like I'm in Michigan anymore. I mean, you you do, but it's just different. There's a different vibe. It's There's not a lot of big cities and stuff, and it's like little towns, and I don't want it. And that's the quaint is not the word. It's just like rugged, I guess, is, yeah. is what I'm looking at. And it's it's an awesome place. Like my goal is to move there some way. But what on an ecological level, what separates it maybe from the rest, if at all? 
Sure. There's different components you could look at with that question. But, you know, if I think of one of my favorite areas in the Upper Peninsula, it's along the south central shorelines. Um, and I think about the Niagara Escarpment, the limestone and dolomite that make up the composition of the the bedrock there. And that's host to its own unique suite of, of species that you might not find anywhere else. Um, and so if you kind of think from the bottom up, like what's going on geologically, the West, Western Michigan has its granite bedrock. We have our limestone bedrock and more in the central East UP. And then you look at the different topography and elevations and you can kind of get these little pockets here and there um, of species that might not occur anywhere else in the world. So it's very fascinating just to kind of look through a le ecological lens, looking at everything from, oh, I can see um, the drumlins on the horizon that were carved out by glaciers. And I can see that this is a sandy outwash plain from glaciers 10,000 years ago that resulted in this unique ecosystem. And then you have your cedar lowland conifer swamps that uh, shift up into your sand dunes. And then that's where you have your oaks and your cherries and your aspen and then you kind of have that unique topography and it's different everywhere you look in the upper peninsula you know so start in the eastern up and you know i went to school at lake superior state university and it doesn't look like much you drive through you're like oh swamp again cool you know <laughs> um not a lot going on or so it seems but then you dig deeper and it has some of the most amazing wetland ecosystems in the state, amazing birding opportunities, um, obviously some of the best agriculture because you're in those um, nutrient rich wetland soils that have been tiled. And then you kind of move along and you get into the, another rich soil type, the limestone with that rich lime component. Um, and you have even better farming soils when you get into, you know, Menominee, Stonington, Garden Peninsula, all through there. And then you get into, you know, the what a lot of people consider like the real UP in the West. You know, you've got your Porcupine Mountains and all those other things. The postcard perfect Upper Peninsula yeah. over there with its own ecosystems going on. Um, so there's not really a place you can look, even in the more developed areas of the Upper Peninsula, where there's not something unique right there. Yeah, it is. And it's such a cool place. One of my goals in life is to see a moose in the upper peninsula because I've seen black bear. I've seen like porcupine and stuff, not mm -hmm. seen a moose and I've seen moose in like Maine. I've seen moose in other parts of the country, but mm -hmm. that's like to Michigan in Michigan. That would just be a cool thing. I know they're on. Well, I don't know if they're still on Isle Royale, but, uh, I, I follow them online and it's like, I don't know, are they, are they dead? Are they, are they still <laughs> there? I, I keep, I lose track, they're, but I know yeah. there's moose up there. Mm -hmm. So they're really awesome, but yeah, it's uh, definitely Moose on Isle Royal. I can account for that. Uh, I saw quite a few on my journey. Uh, I was there for a week um, last year in June, and I only saw cow moose. I didn't see a bull moose, um, mm. but that's not always a bad thing. Um, yeah. So, but the you know I I observed them from afar, drinking from a pond. I observed one without a care in the world with wild forest photograph the heck out of it, just chewing on a balsam fur. Um, and then there were also, I had the amazing experience. I was on top of Mount Franklin. I had just taken my lunch break. And so you hike up to Mount Franklin. It's a great overlook. Uh, you can see Canada, you can see East across Lake Superior. Um, even though the day I went up, it was foggy and you couldn't, but I'm just sitting there eating my lunch and you kind of hear these voices bubbling up. And suddenly the group that I met was the coolest people that I ever could have met coming along the Greenstone Ridge. They were Moose Watch volunteers. And so out of Michigan Tech University and the National Science Foundation and all these groups fund it. Um, but it's the longest ever running predator prey study. And they had one of them had a, a moose skull on his back attached to his already heavy backpack. They had <laughs> femurs they had um antlers they had jaw bones you name it and full-on skulls attached there and then they'll drop those off they'll tag them and they'll kind of study those to get an idea of predator prey interactions um the age when it died like the causes of mortality things like that so i got to kind of pick their brains um and learn about you know some people have been doing it for 40 years on the Whoa. group that i met and other people were like, yeah, it was part of an internship I have to do to get my degree. So that's why I'm here. So 
I grew up in the wrong part of Michigan, I'm telling you. That sounds really <laughs> awesome. And, and, you know, moose just hold this a special place. I don't know why. They're just so big. And, like, I, I think the fact that they could easily just wipe you out makes you demand respect from them. They're just huge animals, but they're just, like, they look so big and goofy, but they're just, like, will rip you apart if they have to. It's so awesome. I don't yeah. know Yeah. There was every time you take a turn on the rugged trails of Isle Royale, you're kind of like, really want to see a moose, but I also really don't want to see a moose. <laughs> yeah, uh, so. they're, they're awesome. So, uh, you know, you you run the gamut. I, I feel like we have a lot in common in the aspect of like we kind of have outdoors ADHD. We just kind of like whatever's presented, I'll go do it. Like if you want to hunt, I'll go. If you want to fish, I'll go. You want a backpack, I'll go. Like it's all, I'm, I'm all in for all of it. I don't care. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you, you do a lot of outdoors activities. What's, uh, what are some of your favorites? I would say like between consumptive, non-consumptive, I don't care. It's all the same to me. It's awesome. Sure. Well, I, um, I'll start with the ones I know and love the most. Um, birding is one of my absolute favorite things to to do birding by ear, birding by sound. Some people will tell you it's not birding unless you see it. I mark it down anyway. I heard it. Um, I'm getting pretty good at birding by ear. And every year I'll focus on a different species that I need to work on the most. So this year was warblers. Um, I've got a soft spot for Kirtland's warblers. I've seen plenty um, and worked with the Forest Service on some of their habitat um, and did my undergraduate thesis on their habitat. Nice. So I got to revisit them where I knew them to be and, and kind of triangulate their location and, you know, just observe them from afar and just enjoy that, you know, they're off the endangered species list and a recovered species, which is a great success. Um, but then I marked off Blackburnian warblers this year, which was a treat. I was in the Hiawatha National Forest and I heard it and I found it and it was a thrill. Um, so, but then next year it's flycatchers and uh, probably shorebirds because this year I was like, huh, I have no idea what that is when I saw <laughs> it, which is very frustrating. Um, and then I'm also very interested in botany. Uh, that's been a new focus of mine. There's nothing that takes your attention more than instead of just walking through a forest and it's all a blur of green and, Oh, there's a wildflower there. It's like, Oh, that's a balsam fir. Oh, that's a black spruce. Oh, that's a pink lady slipper. Oh, that's a bog cranberry. And suddenly the whole world comes alive as you're walking along it and you're picking out these individual species. Mm -hmm. So it's really been very rewarding to observe so much on my hikes. Like it's not just, Oh, yep. That's a, a lowland conifer forest, I could tell you every tree and there's a good chance I could even tell you some of the mosses and lichens you're looking at too at this point. So that's really um, cool. Yeah. Yeah. And then I was fortunate enough this year to be introduced to brook trout fishing. Um, it is the most frustrating, enjoyable thing I have ever done. Uh, I love it. You get to go to some of the most beautiful rivers and streams um, in the upper peninsula, you know, that aren't easy. Like you could take the easy way and go to all the well trotted down spots if you wanted, or if you find a great mentor, like I have, they'll take you to some of the lesser known areas that they've been going to since they were young. And, um, just, so just learning a whole new species. If you had asked me a year ago, what I thought about fish, I would have been like, eh, you know, they're in the water, not my forte. I'm a terrestrial person. And now I'm kind of having my eyes open to this whole ecosystem that I hadn't really been paying as much attention to all because of the fascination of this one species. Mm -hmm. And as someone who probably identifies more as a non-consumptive user than a consumptive user, although that always shifts, um, I would say that it was such a great illustration for me to see how being introduced to a sport just because someone took the time to show it to me, I never would have gone out and tried to find public land access to these rare waterfalls and streams um, and, you know, try and catch a brook trout on my own. You know, Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, I was far too intimidated to do that on my own. So when you find a mentor who's like, yep, let's go teach you the ropes. And then you're literally hooked. It's phenomenal. And it's so funny that you say that because I'm kind of in a similar train of thought. I've, I mean, I've been exposed to fishing my whole life. I mean, down here, I mean, all across Michigan, there's tons of lakes, even uh, like where I was, uh, Southwest Michigan, there's tons of lakes. I mean, grew up on a lake essentially. And it's just like fishing is just a thing that you do. And it was always like a, 
you sit on the dock and you throw the fishing pole and you're just like, whatever. You go out and sit in the boat with your dad and you're like, this is so boring. But as <laughs> I as I get older and I understand that like understanding a a animal, whether it be a fish or a deer or whatever, whatever you're hunting or fishing for. The, like the fun part to me is learning about the animal like oh they're gonna be in this weird depression on this lake and I get to look at maps and I get to look at depth charts and I get to look at like the if the water's clear enough I can literally physically see like oh this plant's down there what is, do they like this do they not like this and you just like kind of like get in this rabbit hole and then you learn and learn and then I don't want to say it becomes easy, but it becomes easier to catch that species because you learn so much about it. It's like, where do you find deer? Well, the more you learn about deer, like, oh, well, now it's easier to find them. And then there's, the, but it never ends. It's forever and ever. You can, there's, you could never learn every minute detail about every species or flower or plant. So to me, that's what gets me hooked in. Like I catch the fish and it's fun. You get to fight for a few minutes or whatever. You catch a bass, whatever it is. Um, and that's, that's like the whole journey is fun. And then I, I refuse to take on fly fishing at this point in time because like I can't, I don't think I can afford it at this point because I've already <laughs> have too many other hobbies, but it does sound fun. And having mm -hmm. a mentor, w we can focus on that for a minute. That is so important for yeah. a lot of people. If like, especially if it's something you're intimidated by, like brook trout, they're kind of like this mysterious they have this aura around them that are these beautiful fish that you can only be found in certain types of streams in certain areas mm -hmm. they're awesome so i would like to like tell people about mentorship it's really important if you see someone with that interest just invite them out like you have enough equipment to share i'm sure if you're in the outdoors we all have way yeah. too much crap so yeah. you know what what has that been like for you having a mentor like what are the what what specifically do you enjoy about that? Yeah, I would say um, I think it's been very humbling uh, for me because, I, you know, I've been in the career field for 10 years. There's not much I thought you could tell me, even about species that I don't pursue on my own, that I didn't know. But then just to see, one, the patience that they show you, um, even as a 25-year-old adult who thinks she's got it all figured out. Um, but and but they talk to you as an equal, like, hey, like, look at it from this perspective. Um, think about it from this perspective. Um, you know, this is what I know. Let me show you knowledge that I gained that has been passed down to me. Um, but then they, they're learning along with you as well. Mm -hmm. um, so they don't come in like, oh, like, here's your instruction manual. Go over there, stand there, do this, do, 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 do. When you get the fish, do this. It's very much um, kind of like a candid experience with that person. Yeah. And so maybe they come across a scenario that they've never come across, or that's the biggest brook trout that they've ever seen out of this hole. And so you get to kind of share that and build that bond. Um, and then kind of be humbled, uh, by that experience as well. Yeah, that's, I think that's so important. I mean, I'm no master outdoorsman or anything, but if I have friends that like even hint that they want to go out, I'm like, we're loading up the kayaks. Let's go. I don't care. Yeah. Throw my pole in the water and lose it forever. Let them get <laughs> you out on the water. Like, I don't care if you know what you're doing. I'll give you all of my equipment. Let's go. Just to get one person stoked about the outdoors is like mm -hmm. a huge win for me and everything I do. Uh, and on, on the other side of it, believe it or not, I birding is another thing where it's so difficult when you get started and it's fun. And I've gotten into it recently in the last few years, even though I don't look the type, you know, I talk about hunting and fishing all day long on this podcast and like brutal outdoors adventures, like hiking these long trails and stuff. But like, Anything that has to do with the outdoors, I'm in. It's fun. Mm -hmm. Like though like you were talking about the Kirtland's warbler. They're so small, they're so fast, and I just love doing photography. And like if you think hunting is hard, try and take a camera with a 600 millimeter <laughs> lens on it that weighs like five or six pounds and like try and get this bird that's like 10 feet away from you that's the size of like a big, I don't know, like a I don't know grape or yeah. something they're not that big you can't it, even get them in your binoculars on a good day so a camera lens is tough <laughs> and it's and it's so fun and frustrating it's no get the same thrill as hunting for me yep. essentially and it's like unlimited and you like down here we have what they call the biggest week in birding during the big yes. migration in may and you know if you were to go out in the middle of the 
the crowds and yell Kirtland's Warblers and you were just joking, you'd probably get murdered. They'd probably just <laughs> murder you in the streets because of that. So, you know, it's really fun. And, and I think in the kind of the hunting world, they, it can be a lot of like hyper masculine, like I'm not doing that, but it doesn't hurt to know the animals that are around you. Like it only is going to help increase your skill. No, you know, the greatest woodsmen and woodswomen that I know are pointing out just as many plants and birds as they are like, Oh, there's a deer trail. There's deer sign. Look at that mm-hmm. rub. We're close to this. This is where they bed. Oh, this is, you know, this bird species, they nest in these lowland certain kind of conifers. So deer like to bed in those too. So this is a great spot to be. Um, and so I think that's the amazing thing people don't realize is that they find their niche, right. And they get hooked on it. Like mm-hmm. I am a hunter, uh, non-consumptive, whatever. Don't want to talk about it. But if I talk to you about pheasant habitat, the parallel to that is pollinator habitat. If I talk to you about um, hardwood or, you know, maybe some of our mature forest cedar and hemlock forests, maybe some of the old growth forests that we all love. I'm also talking to you about some of the most critical wintering grounds for deer in the Upper Peninsula. And so... There's so many parallels um, when you kind of start to allow yourself to see the bigger picture of conservation. Um, I think labels serve a purpose, you know, consumptive, non-consumptive, birding, botany, you name it. Um, But at the same time, they can also be a hindrance. And so I really worked on like, if we didn't have to stick a name on everything and put a hashtag on everything and all that, I mean, if I just went out and had a conversation with you, you would realize that if I was talking about birds or plants or whatever, there's parallels to all the same game species that you care about as well. Yeah. And that's something that I always try and get across as well is that there is like, there's no birding event without the Great Lakes because it's a huge migratory path for these birds when they're coming up north. And then there's no Great Lakes without talking about like zebra mussels and all this stuff and all these issues that are going on or, you know, carp or AOI or what all these issues that have been like throughout the years. And there's no talking about, you know, bird conservation without talking about hunting and fishing. It, like it all is in the same pool. It doesn't matter what you like you're into. They're all interconnected. And mm-hmm. that's the point I try and get because I've noticed, I've said this like nonstop for the last every podcast I've ever done is like the the gap between the the consumptive and non-consumptive user is so hard to bridge because they're like diametrically opposed to each other on like thought, like the way that yep. they view the outdoors. But like I feel like I've just like broken through and like doing all these different things, I'm like, they're all, we're all in the same boat. We're all like, if something affects a hunter and their wildlife population, it's going to affect you as a hiker because you're never mm-hmm. going to see the animal again if it disappears or if its habitat gets cut down, you're not going to be able to go enjoy that either. So I exactly. think it's like getting people on the same page is difficult, but I think it's possible. And that's like yep. the running theme of my whole spiel for the whole podcast. That's the summary. So do you have any luck with that in your career so far? I know you say you've been doing this for a little over 10 years or so. Yeah. It's difficult. Oh gosh, it's hard. So <laughs> with the DNR, it was, you know, you have your segments, right? And you, one thing I've realized over the years is, federal government, you're focused more on non-game, non-game species, species that are sensitive to activities, multi-use recreation. And then the DNR has multi-use recreation as well, but their funds are about game species. That's what funds, you know, their department for the natural or wildlife division. So that's what they're obviously going to focus on, but they're kind of learning how to skirt that line to and engage more non-consumptive users of talking about golden wing warbler, warbler habitat is synonymous with woodcock habitat. So they're kind of learning that as well. Um, um, so you have your game, your non-game, and then with MUCC, it was fantastic because obviously it's a phenomenal organization filled with, you know, representing the hunters, the trap- trappers, the anglers, but really any conservationist who understands where funds are coming from, um, and what is making the species, uh, the habitats they love available to them. Mm-hmm. And so I enjoyed Uh, that component of my career very much because I got to talk with everybody at the table. I was talking with folks with the National Wild Turkey Federation, Pheasants Forever, um, all those, you know, 
consumptive groups, but then I was also working with the Nature Conservancy and uh, local land conservancies and nonprofits that were very much focused on um, thinking about things in a more non-consumptive way. So I kind of made it you know, my point to introduce the on the ground program uh, to those organizations in the, the Nature Conservancy and to kind of build that rapport. Um, and Pat Hogan, you mentioned it before, he was a great catalyst for introducing MUCC to the Nature Conservancy um, and doing habitat work at Petersburg State Game Area in southeast Michigan. Because um, if it's benefiting the blazing star borer moth, which is a species of con- concern, then it's also benefiting wild turkey and other, you know, game species. So um, kind of building those bridges. And then now that I'm in a very unique role, I get to work with landowners all across the central upper peninsula. And I meet all kinds of kinds. I meet some that very much just have a great stewardship ethic. They want to manage the land for um, you know, ecological health, resilience. They want it to be their grandkids one day and have that legacy left. And then you meet people who want big bucks. I just want big bucks. I want this, this, this. Don't even talk to me about anything else. Steve Rinella <laughs> told me all about it. I know exactly what I have to do. And so uh, you meet really all kinds of kinds. And it's very hard to, because, you know, I'm going into your property and I'm thinking, these are the resource concerns I'm looking for as a, a federal employee local, you know, uh, stewardship person. And this is what we need to focus on. And I kind of have to learn how to talk your language. So I can pin a person pretty quick based just when they tell me their objectives, like, okay, Mm -hmm. this guy buys, bought this land because he wants a deer camp. This person wants this land because they want to leave their kids a legacy, yada, yada, yada. And so you kind of learn to adapt your language and find points where you can say, you know what? Absolutely. We're going to retain the cedar stand for winter cover for white-tailed deer. <clears throat> and then, but you know what? We're going to regenerate this uh, stand next to it that's maybe in poorer health. We're going to regenerate some aspen, get some young early successional forest growing in there. And that's going to benefit, oh, golden wing warblers. Oh, white-tailed deer love to browse it. And then so you find those ways to build that connection and kind of hit on key points, but also maybe expanding their their worldview to remind them that there's a lot more going on on your property than deer. And also you need more than food plots to get deer people like. (laughs) So I think that's been one of the biggest things I've been trying to teach people. Uh, So it's been um, incredibly challenging, but I, I've definitely noticed even in the older population, you know, that has historically been more consumptive, more reserved, and maybe their worldview about conservation, there's been an awakening. There's an increased interest in habitats for species that, oh, they're recently getting into bird watching. How do I bring this bird around more? Oh, my kids really love butterflies. Let's do pollinator habitat or my grandkids. So I would say we're closer than ever before, um, even in the ten short 10 years I've been in here to bridging that gap. Good. That's what I want to hear. That's exactly what I want to hear. With your work, you're working with the USDA and NRCS. So very long names. If you don't know what they are, look them up or you can explain them. But So you you briefly broke down what you're doing there. Uh, So what's like kind of your main role? I know I'm still even kind of uh, fuzzy on like how the USDA interacts with with conservation and things like that. Like I'm I'm trying to piece it all together, but there's – I mean – for people getting into that, there's, there's a lot to take in. I mean, I've been researching this stuff for five, six years now, and I'm still just like, what is going on? There's so much. Yep. So so how does that how does that interact, like USDA, NRCS, all these big organizations, federal levels kind of stuff? How do they interact with conservation? 
Sure. So the USDA or United States Department of Agriculture Natural Resources Conservation Service, so just so you know what I'm talking about, we'll say USDA and RCS from now on. They are a branch of the USDA. They're alongside their own agency with like the Forest Service as a sister agency, for example, in the USDA. But they came about in the 1930s um, in the Dust Bowl era kind of when the United States, exactly when the United States was having its conservation awakening. It's when the Dust Bowl was happening and dust storms were coming from the plains into Washington, D.C., and erosion was horrible and farmland was ruined and wildfires were raging because the forest had been butchered and wildlife was extirpated here everywhere. Um, We lost species. We were losing this and that. And suddenly we realized we had a crisis on our hands. So that bore, um, that resulted in the Soil Conservation Service being born um, in the 1930s. So right along that timeline of when Pitt and Roberts was getting funded, when the Migratory Bird Treaty Act was coming about, MUCC was being founded, you know, all these things were happening on local and, and national scales. And so, you know, the soil conservation came around or service came around to specifically address erosion on uh, American croplands, because obviously a nation without its soil is very weak if it can't produce its own food and provide for its own population. Mm -hmm. And so addressing that, realizing, you know, what was at play and kind of bringing, nurturing those lands back to health in a way that, so agriculture was the big focus and, you know, bringing back the resiliency resiliency of those landscapes so that they could produce food without sacrificing the health of the soil so that it was useless um, in America's heartland. But then eventually that conservation ethic expanded to address a variety of resource concerns because now we're not just looking at soil health, we're looking at water health, we're looking at wildlife health, we're looking at forest health. And then, you know, the federal government is big. The states own a lot of property in Michigan. The federal government owns its own millions of acres. But also, but the United States is still, what, 670-some percent owned privately. And so that puts the emphasis on what people are doing on their private land. It's critical to the health of a nation. It's not just what's going on on federal land. It's not just what's going on on state land. So that's where the Natural Resource Conservation Service was rebranded, I think in the 90s, but I might be incorrect on that. Um, Or so the Soil Conservation Service got its new name, Natural Resources Conservation Service in that time. And to kind of cover the broad scope of all the resource concerns that were being addressed. And now Um, What my role is specifically is working with the conservation district and USDA together to bring about and address local resource concerns in the central upper peninsula. And there's uh, 70 some conservation districts across Michigan. There's 83 counties in Michigan. So um, and they're usually housed in the same offices as the USDA and RCS because they're working so collaboratively with farm bill programs um, that landowners can enroll in and do habitat enhancements, um, whether it's agriculture, um, crops, um, cattle, livestock, or forest lands are critical to us as well, grasslands. And so working with each landowner on their own goals and providing either just general technical assistance and letting them know what they could be doing better or differently to get the results they want or enrolling them into cost share programs that help ease the burden of them implementing those changes. Yeah. And so one thing that I think is a, I don't know if it's a misconception, I guess there's people tend to be, especially with environmental Mm -hmm. issues and wildlife issues. I don't, the only word that I can use to relate to it that makes any sense is like radicalized, especially <laughs> I don't want to say it's easy to get radicalized about it when you see like habitat destruction or like with the Great Lakes, all the issues going on with the Great Lakes and the biggest uh, place where they want to yell and attack is farming. And I've been yelled at for this, for saying these things on the podcast, not in like an aggressive way, like just taken out Mm -hmm. of context in this world we live in with clips and things where you only show like 10 seconds on Instagram or something. So the, the thing is, is like, there's no possible way for us to survive as like human beings on this earth without farming. It is literally impossible at this point in time. We, if farming went away, we would be dead. There would be not enough to sustain a population, especially where we're at right now. We're in the billions and billions of people on earth. So 
I want to make that clear, but like, I don't think that there's certain <laughs> segments of farming that are causing more damage than others. It's like that there's it's a, such a interwoven system because where I live is incredibly rural. Like yes. I live in a cornfield. Like that is where my house is. So like I'm very well aware of these issues and I don't want to make it seem like farming is bad cuz it's not. It's vital to what we do. I think that it's it's you're in a weird position working it's like sort of with the USD. I don't know how involved you are with farm stuff but like there, I, where can we find a balance between, like, down here, for instance, CAFOs are a huge issue mm-hmm. that people are talking about. There's, like, kind of this weird, with the algal blooms of Lake Erie and all these, this toxic algae, which is literally going on right now uh, right. outside the door here. I mean, it's a huge issue. It's, it's making people sick and things, and they've there's groups out here that have targeted it down to CAFOs and, and things of this nature and blah, blah, blah. You've heard the argument a million times. Mm-hmm. Um, and people are getting really upset on both sides and it's like going to come to a head eventually. But like, do you see solutions that maybe could between the both sides? Because like some, uh, some, some point we're going to have to bring this to a head that's going to make sense to everyone. Because, like, right now we're in the early stages of, like, figuring out what's going on and people are just, like, budding heads terribly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the government's involved in that, obviously, because they manage a lot of this stuff and they allow the permitting and things like that. And I don't know how at liberty you are to say working for the government, but, like, just general thoughts on, like, how we can make this work. Because it's, like, getting to a point where it's, like, everyone's arguing we're not getting anywhere. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) Is what I'm getting at. Yeah, and they're absolutely right. Um, so it's tough working with, you know, you see, I see both sides pretty easily. Um, mm-hmm. But I'll say, you know, and I can only speak to the landowners that I've worked with in the Upper Peninsula, but mm-hmm. nine times out of 10, they contact us willingly, which I think is very unique about um, the conservation programs we do because they they know something's wrong or something could be going better, right? Mm-hmm. They want... And usually when you improve the ecosystem, you improve the soil health, you improve your operation, not only are you seeing more profitability, but your whole landscape comes back alive. You've got Mm -hmm. wildlife you haven't seen. You've got insects you haven't seen. The rivers are healthier, you know. And so I would think it would be a very narrow point of view, you know, if, if anyone had it that farmers don't care about the land that they're working, that they make their living off of. Um, and that their family has made a living off of. And I think they do have um, uh, an incredible conscience that's only growing recently. But um, and I think the work that they're doing, especially coming willingly to enroll in conservation programs for increased efficiency with their cropping systems, with their cattle operations, you name it, um, and ways to offset maybe the negative impact that they're having on their local ecosystem, their local watershed, their local community. Um So I don't know how it will all play out. It's different in every region, depending on the density of the agriculture or the rural community or the urban community next door. And, um, but I will say that we've come so far in conservation. Conservation is a young field. Um, Mm, It's, it's, especially conservation biology and natural resource management as a whole. I mean, really they've only been, haven't, been around since really the 70s that's really when the environmental movement came to life again in the united states you know you think about the clean water act clean air act all these things where it we were reminded once again uh that these resources are not infinite and so we have to and that things accumulate in negative ways so and then technology is advancing social values are shifting there's so many different components at play that they all have to work themselves out eventually um but i would certainly say that the farmers that i know the landowners that i know whether it's private forest land or crop land or grazing land they have a an amazing uh stewardship ethic uh they work very hard um so that they can balance their livelihood but also bring life back to the landscape, do right by the land. Um, and not only cause you know, they have families too, that they're thinking about their kids yeah. and their grandkids and they love their community. They're feeding, you know, the state and the country with the work that they're doing. And so it's always good to remember that we're still learning, we're still growing and it takes time 
for all these programs and all this knowledge and this funding, you know, to reach. It's not easy to shift your entire operation, what you've been doing for 40 years Mm -hmm. and get the technology you need to be more efficient, use less fossil fuels, prevent erosion, grow a riparian buffer back where you'd been cropping right to the river, you know, and, and, or that, um, watershed. So, but things are in progress and nothing is immediate, even though the hard work is being put in, but it's on its way. Yeah. And a lot of the times, you know, the the worst argument I ever hear is like, why can't they just stop doing this? It's like, so well, imagine if, the, imagine if you were at work one day and somebody, you know, some angry person came to you and said, Hey, The place that you're working is polluting the whatever it is outside here or a hundred miles away. It's polluting this. I want you to just quit and go home and and not do this anymore. They'd be like, are you out of your mind? Like, this is how Mm -hmm. I take care of my family. Like, you can't just be like, hey, farmer, stop doing this. Like, he's probably bought $50,000 worth of whatever to spray on his field. Like, you can't just return it. You can't return. Like, I don't know. It's such a... Everybody wants such easy solutions and we're dealing with like millions and millions, if not billions of dollars and like people's lives and and tons of land and space that's not just going to, like you said, be changed overnight. It's going to take decades to fix and Mm -hmm. it sucks that it's that way, but just kind of like with anything, like you lose an arm, you're stuck with it for the rest of your life. It sucks, but. I mean, it, you're stuck. It is what it is. You're going to have to deal with it. So yeah, I, right. I'm, I'm right there with you. It's like, it's, things are happening. It's just, you're going to have to fight for it if you really think. And the arguments I hear is like, well, what the, the flip side of that is like, well, what are you doing then? If it's that important to you, go do something, go to the mm-hmm. town halls, go to the, this, the, that, go talk to your representatives. Like if you're sitting at home, you're just complaining. So like, <laughs> yep. <laughs> Absolutely. And you know, if you're really concerned about agriculture, you should be contacting your senators and your representatives. I mean, the farm bill programs in the federal government is largely responsible for interacting with farmers and the Food Security Act and, and making sure those lands are productive and working collaboratively with agricultural producers across the United States. So if you have a concern, um, you know, voice it to your your federal representative, but also don't dehumanize the people that put the food on your table because they're working beyond our knowledge of, you know, how, day and night, in and out, uh, working very hard. And they do care. Um, I don't think I've met a single person, you know, in this career that that didn't have some kind of environmental conscience or care about the land. And yeah, maybe they're a little rough around the edges and that's just how they do it. And they've been doing it that way since their great grandfather, but it's a, there's a shift in the ethic and people do care. So, and it's a big issue. It deserves to be discussed. I'm glad people are passionate about it, but don't bite the hand that feeds you and try and understand (laughs) where they're coming from and the struggles that they face. I mean, if you look at what it costs to run a farm and the price of herbicide and pesticide and seed and tilling and diesel and all these things that people don't realize go into it, the equation gets a lot more complicated. Yeah. I mean, I'm surrounded by farmers who are like, I barely made it this year. I hope next year is better. And it's like, imagine if that was your life, like your life depended on how much of the food survived. That would be nuts be broke right. all the time but you know on a on a flip note i saw you know just go way off into left field here i, I saw you <laughs> did some uh you got to study some northern goshawks cool yeah. birds uh what was that like because you know birds of prey have a special place to like a moose kind of they're just like everybody loves the bird of prey because they're just they have this aura around them and mm-hmm. they're they're just, they are cool i mean you see them up in the sky they, they look majestic yeah. Yeah. There's nothing I love more than Northern goshawks. They're hands down my favorite avian species and probably my favorite wildlife species in general. Um, so when I was with the federal government uh, doing research on uh, federal land, one of the uh, resources or, you know, wildlife components that we looked at was what we identified as regional forest or sensitive species. So species that were uh, indicators of overall ecological health of certain forest lands uh, that we're managing. Because remember, um, your state and federal lands are not just managed for wildlife. They're also managed for timber. They're also managed for recreation. They're also managed for this and that. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the components is, you know, you're going out and surveying 
uh, these raptor nests, whether it's red-shouldered hawks or northern goshawks are two important indicator species because of their unique habitat requirements. And there's nothing quite like a northern goshawk. Um, if you've been, some will say, unfortunate enough to stumble upon them during the breeding season, you might have got dive-bombed on your head, maybe lost a clump of hair. Um, <laughs> so when we would go do surveys, you always had your hard hat on. You always had uh, eyeglasses on because they will go after your face. They will go after a truck. They will, they're very, very protective. Um, so going out and finding their nests and those unique ecosystems was an important and amazing component of my internship with the Forest Service that I really loved. Um, and the thing about goshawks, you know, it's almost like like you kind of touched on. It's one of those species, any raptor species, it's wild, right? It can't be tamed. You can see it a thousand times and it'll still amaze you. And I think the ferocity that goshawks have particularly, I think it was you know, legend has it that Genghis Khan had the symbol of the goshawk on his cap because it symbol, uh, you know, it couldn't be tamed. It was ferocious. It, it was just, you know, an absolute fighter. And because they're found all around the world, but they're very sensitive to their ecosystems. And um, but goshawks, I love them even when, you know, the Forest Service or another agency had planned to do a timber harvest in the area. They had to leave a buffer for those forest sensitive species so that they weren't disturbed. But they could be surrounded by a clear cut, this goshawk, and it would still be the most wild thing you'd ever see. It was just the most amazing thing. So they definitely hold a special place to me. They're one of those species that when you think about wilderness, when you think about why did I become a conservationist? They pop into my head. Yeah. And they are, yeah, just cool birds. So I was in Texas a few months ago and there was a girl down there. She works at the Wild Turkey Federation. Uh, mm -hmm. She does falconry and wow. I don't know if I'm right or not, but I believe she had a northern goshawk as sure. one, the bird that she had. And it was intimidating there is a big bird and it, I was like, I don't want to get near this thing. It was like on a leash basically and it was flying around. And she's like, yeah, I take it out and I hunt it. And I'm like, that's so cool. I could never do that. Yeah. But did you read that book? What is it like H's for Hawk or whatever? I was just about to say, yeah. yep, it's yeah. a phenomenal book. Yeah, it's, I, well, I was asking her and I was like, so yeah, I, I know that book. Every you know, H's for Hawk. She's like, it's nothing like that. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, I don't know what that lady's talking about. I was like, oh, that is not what I thought it would be like. So, but yeah, that is a great book. Everybody should check it out if they haven't already. But uh, yeah, the, the, do you, what do you think about falconry? It's such a weird thing. Like, there's such a subculture of subculture of subculture mm -hmm. in the outdoors. Like I didn't really know anything about it until I talked to her. I was like, that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. It's a weird thing. Yeah, I think I can't speak to it in too much detail because I've never pursued it myself. Um, but I will say I've met some falconers and the connection they have with the animal is fascinating. Um, obviously, it, it's primarily food and reward based, you know, like I'm going to feed you if you come back. Um, and that's kind of, you know, but the bond that's there is real. And I think it's fascinating that you're utilizing, uh, you know, a master hunter to kind of work um, collaboratively with you to achieve your goal. And I think, you know, it kind of combines two of the things humans crave the most of uh, getting food on the table, but then connecting to nature at the same time on a whole nother level. So I can definitely see the appeal. I would love to have a hawk on my arm, but the other part of me is like, you do not deserve a leather strap attached to you. You should be up in the forest flying far away yeah. from me. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it's one of those, there's definitely a lot of respect between um, the hunter and the, the falconer and the actual raptor itself. So I think it's a, a great field, you know, component of the world that's not talked about often, but it's certainly fascinating. It's so fascinating. It's I don't mm -hmm. I don't think I could do it. Like, I don't know if I don't have the time or the patience to, like, be that detailed with an animal. But like, mm -hmm. I can bear, like I got a, a new cat. And it, like, I can't even keep that thing under control. Like, how am I going to do a bird that could rip my eyes out? I don't want anything to do with that. Uh, so, you know, I know the UP, besides having like really cool, stylish hats, you got those cool UP hats. I have my, yes, I have my own in green because that's the coolest color. Uh, you know, the UP is awesome, but you guys have quite the hunting tradition up there. And you, you say you've done some hunting yourself. Mm -hmm. How is honing in 
you know, whatever you hunt for. I mean, I would assume it's whitetail like everything yeah, else. Is, you are is, correct. <laughs> uh, so what's hunting like up there? Because for me, I don't know if it's because I've only been hunting for like five or six years or if the there's not as many deer down here in Northwest Ohio. What's, how, how is it? How is it? I don't know if you have anything to compare it to other than hunting up north, but like, is it is it a lot of deer or is it a pain in the ass like down here where you're just like, I might not see a deer for four or five days and then some days I see like 15. Yeah, so deer are smart. They know what seems when rifle season starts. I think they got their they calendar do. out because they disappear into the deep woods and the cedar they swamps um, up here especially. But I mean, up here it's not uncommon. I have, even this winter uh, on the bay I live on, on Lake Michigan, we watched a herd of maybe 12, 15 deer cross the ice and go into the conifers on the other side of the the lake, you know, so they're crossing Lake Michigan, kind of at uh, one of the bays there, and then they disappear. But I'm, but it's also in, when you're in the agricultural component this time of year, they're everywhere. Mm-hmm. I see about 10 deer on my way to work in the morning. And I'm just like, just stay where you are. Don't run out in front of me. <laughs> um, and so I don't know about how to compare deer densities between, you know, um, you know, different regions of the state. I know they have a big issue with, you know, they have to call deer around Ann Arbor and Grand Rapids and, and in certain metropolitan areas downstate. Um, and they kind of lose that. They have no predators down there really to worry about. So they just graze the lawns and they're complacent towards humans and they're just bumbling around and <laughs> spreading disease, you know. So it's a very different world. Not that we don't have CWD in the Upper Peninsula. It is in some of the core counties on the western side. But I think the the experience for the deer is very different up here. You have uh, far more natural predators. There's wolves. There's a uh, far pro- denser bear population. Um, more coyotes to worry about with fawn mortality. Um, all kinds of different things at play up here. Bobcat, you name it. And so I think their interactions with humans are very different. So, yeah, you'll have the ones who are grazing the, the soybean field and couldn't have a care in the world. Um, but then you also have that when that pressure increases from a variety of whether it's in the forest with other uh, predator species or when they get more pressure from hunters, it's a very different component. They become incredibly elusive. Mm-hmm. Uh, so did you grow up hunting or is it something that you kind of got into on your own? Oh, I grew up hunting very much. So my birthday is November 30th. So, uh, as you can imagine, the deal between me and my parents was that I would have venison on my birthday every year. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, I think it's just what it is in northern Michigan and the Upper Peninsula. You had the day off of school. You went out with your parents on opening day of a fi- regular firearm season and you got your deer. Um, and so that's what it was growing up. And so me and my siblings would all kind of take turns. So usually my brother always got his, the older he got, he was just go out in his own line and do his own thing. But, you know, I was fortunate to grow up on a hundred acres of land. Um, so we, we would all kind of split up and, and have our eye on the deer all summer that we were watching, you know, and then we'd go from there. So, and our, both our, my parents sat out in the uh, blind with us, my mother and my father. So, and my mother was there when I caught my first fish. So I was very lucky that I had two parents to, to kind of wrangle us, uh, me and my siblings in the woods. That's, that's so cool. I always like the, it's weird because the majority of the people that I know did not grow up hunting. And we're mm-hmm. like, like there's this core pe- group of people I know and we're just like trying to figure this out. And it's just like, I am in like a 20 year deficit compared to everyone else around me who's been doing this forever. They're like, it's so easy. I'm like, I'm like out here in the middle of the woods in camo. I have no idea what I'm doing, but <laughs> it's, it gets a little bit, I don't want to say easier, but it gets a little more, uh, you understand what's going on a little bit better is what I should say. So Yeah, that- absolutely. And I got away from hunting um, when I went to college. I didn't hunt for five, six years straight. Um, and then I, you know, rolled right into a career. I moved downstate. And that was the big thing for me. I was like, um, I'm used to my own private hundred acres of every habitat I could ever want. What am I supposed to do with all these other people <laughs> who are sitting next to me on public land? Like that's incredibly intimidating because people have their spots. Suddenly I'm in someone's spot and that old guy is really mad at me. He's like, yeah. I've been hunting here for 40 years. And I'm like, well, I found it first. So, <laughs> Public land. Um, yeah. So it, it was incredibly intimidating. Um, 
you know, and I'm no stranger to going out in the woods. I don't mind it at one bit, but when I, when you sign it, kind of start to realize the pressure in that public land means something very different where you're actually seeing other people on public land downstate, it gets crowded down there. That was very eye opening. Um, in the upper peninsula, it was never like that, you know, even during some firearm seasons and small game season, you name it. Um, you didn't usually see too many folks around in your spots. Yeah. And, um, so, but going downstate, and I'm like, why are all these cars parked in this this driveway? Oh man, packed in there, and then <laughs> turn it around. So, yeah, yeah. So I can definitely understand in the struggle, and then the intimidation with getting back into it. You know, coming up, I was lucky to just be able, like, hey, Dad, I'm ready to go back into the woods. Uh, <laughs> Want to sit with me? And absolutely. So, yeah. Well, it's it's definitely interesting. Like the difference between public land and private land. I've never actually got to hunt on public land because like there's a state forest near me, but all I've heard is horror stories. And like everyone that I've known that's hunted, they're like, dude, don't go there. Like you're going to get BBs from people shooting shotguns. Like, like like you don't want to be there. And I'm like, it scared me. I should go for myself and, and test the grounds, but it's kind of like, like, uh, What's the saying? It's always it's good to have a boat, but it's better to have a friend with a boat. It's like it's good to have <laughs> yeah. land, but it's better to have a friend with some land where you can go hunt. And you know, mm-hmm. down here it's all farm fields and stuff, so that's great. Yeah. But I I really enjoy it, and I think it's a good way. I inadvertently ended up like by the skin of my teeth because deer season's coming up here in the next couple of month, like a month, like September, late September down here in Ohio. Mm-hmm. And I have, like, managed to subsist fully on, like, deer and fish that I've caught for this whole year. And my freezer has, like, nothing left in it. But I, like, inched by. I think I'm going to make it if I can stretch it a little further, which is a cool feeling as, like, someone who started doing this as an adult. It's a really fun thing. So, you know, that's that's always a fun thing for me. Do you you have a – something that was hard for me to get over – was like seeing this animal die and then like watching it get butchered and stuff and then like eating that there's always that in the back of your mind like i just saw this thing get like its guts ripped out it's kind of gross mm-hmm. and like as i go on i don't care anymore i like caught a shark and i ate that like a couple of months ago <laughs> like i'm not like it's the, i don't eat anything at this point in time right. but growing up with it you probably didn't have that because it's just like that's you have deer all the time you know yeah um but i'll say i never thought anything about it as a child growing up it was just what you did your parents strung it up you got it da, 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 da. it's just what it is never thought twice about it but when i got back into it in the past few years even catching a fish after all those years of not fishing and like keeping the catch and filleting it myself and doing all that i mm-hmm. cried I did. I was because I I feel like and I have no shame in that because to me, it's this incredibly rewarding experience where I'm so incredibly proud that I harvested it myself. Um, I feel grateful to the resource that I'm putting food in my freezer, that I'm going to be sustained by this this living thing. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the same time, I also acknowledge that a life was given for like so that I can eat. And so to me, I think it just enhances my connection with the natural world. And that's what I love about fishing. That's what I love about hunting is that it gives you a whole different level of gratitude and connection to the resource. It's not just seeing it through a binocular lens. Mm -hmm. Like you're literally connecting to the species on a whole different level. And I think there's honor in acknowledging what emotions that brings out in you. I think that's badass. Yeah. That's exactly, you know, it's like every time I, I get to eat an animal that I've harvested myself and, it's like a replay reel in my mind of like that whole season, like the just the suffering through the cold or the wet and the sun and the heat. It's just like whatever. It was all worth it. And it's like you get this little mini replay reel in your head like, I remember when I caught this. I was in yeah. the middle of the freaking ocean. It was so cool. So like, yeah, yeah I would 100% agree with that. And I, you know, I feel like, I'll, like people – need to experience that i don't like never would want to force anybody to try hunting and fishing but i think once you have that connection it all starts to make so much more sense like oh there's like renewable resource and i can just you know one deer can last me 10 months if it's a decent size like oh okay that makes sense like 
Yeah. It's not like going to the grocery store, you know. So, but anyway, I could talk all day. Uh, before we go, before we wrap up here, I know you got a lot of stuff to do. Uh, mm-hmm. You probably, you know, you've been all around Michigan with your work and stuff like that. I'm not sure if you've traveled a lot around the world or the U.S. or anything. Like, I always say you could spend your lifetime traveling Michigan and you would still not be able to see everything. It's such a cool place. Is there any places that you've really been or want to go in the future that are like on the bucket list, maybe wherever worldwide. I always interested to see what people say. Sure. Um, I will absolutely go back to Isle Royal again and again and again and again, I'm going again next year. Um, (laughs) it's, you won't know until you go the feeling that you will get there. They call it topophilia. It's when you feel this connection to place. Um, and it's unique to everyone, although everyone feels it. Um, and so that is probably the place that has really stirred something in my soul the most. Um, and the fact that it's in Michigan is even better because I plan to live and die on the Upper Peninsula for the, you know, so that's, this is where I'll be. Um, but regarding, there's no place I don't want to see. I would have loved to see, and this is going to be a classic conservationist thing, Yellowstone, um, Yosemite. I want to see those ecosystems. I want to see, you know, that unique, um, just the wildlife that's there, the reintroduction, like so much of the heart of conservation was in the West. I haven't seen the West. It's on my list. I've heard, I'm afraid that if I go, I won't come back. So maybe that's why I haven't gone. Um, But just to see kind of where it all started with Theodore Roosevelt um, in Yosemite and and Yellowstone and all those places. And there's so many, the United States boasts some of the most amazing ecosystems in the world, you know, and we're a natural resource powerhouse and we know it. That's why we're so formidable on the international stage, I feel like. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I could probably think of places, other places in the world, but I think even just North America would satisfy me for a lifetime. So Absolutely. I would agree. Uh, I have been out West and it's pretty dope, but (laughs) Michigan kicks a lot of ass. Like I, I prefer Michigan to a lot of places and I got people commenting on this stuff. Like stop telling people about Michigan, dude. I'm like, I'm sorry. It's just so cool. I love Michigan. Like I spend a lot of time there. Yeah. It's bittersweet because every time I see a out of state plate on the road, I'm like, Oh, darn it. US (laughs) two is getting crowded up here. But at the same time, I'm like, I'm glad you know about it because if you know about it, you're going to care about it. And so we need that. Amen to that. And on that note, I want to thank you for talking. You know, I think we covered some a pretty broad range. I would say this is one of the broadest ranges we've gone on a podcast. So thank you for that. And yeah, thank you for working in conservation and just like trying to make the world this much better for wildlife and people and everyone involved. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me.